So good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to the IEHG NDTP UCD Grand Rounds uh, for this month. And it's the second of three webinars on patient safety, which is being led by John Fitzsimons, who's Clinical Director for Quality Improvement. Um, so I'm going. To, this, this one is focusing on human factors in patient safety, but John is going to start giving you a recap from the first lecture in the series uh, on the science of patient safety. So I'll hand over to John. Thanks, Tomas, and, and good morning, everybody. You're very welcome, and thank you for coming back to join us today. I, I'm just going to do a very quick uh, recap on, on the major things that we uh, discussed the last day, and then in doing that, I'm going to introduce our two speakers this morning uh, on the topic of human factors. So just to, to kind of recap on the key lessons uh, from, from when we spoke uh, a month ago now. Um, so. Uh, I hope uh, if you got to join us the last time, if you watched the video, uh, that we made clear that patient safety is a scientific uh, endeavor. And, 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 and we say that because it's underpinned by research and learning from, from healthcare and from other safety critical industries. And we've learned a lot uh, from, from industries out of healthcare, but in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, patient safety research in itself uh, has, has informed much of what we do and much of what we think about patient safety. The key lesson I think I was trying to leave people with the last time, and if there's one thing you take away from my recap today, it's this, it's that safety is both the absence of harm and it's the reliable practice of being safe. So when we talk about safety, we can't just say it's, 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 it's you know, that there's no harm happening from the care we provide. That, that of course, is really important. It's also really important to think of safety as, as what we do. Uh, and that's really important when we try and, and, and promote safety and to, uh, to teach it and to research it. Um, if you recall, the last time we, we described three systems of, of, of uh, uh, systems approach to safety, uh, and I'm going to quickly just, just recap on those uh, with three uh, broad headings, finding and fixing failure. That was kind of the original way we started thinking about safety when things had gone wrong that we learned and we uh, we worked out a way of of, of uh, what happened and how could we how could we fix that and and the questions there are if you imagine a fall uh, a patient falling uh, just to give a simple example you know who fell today why did they fall how could we prevent that then in recent years we've, we've started to focus much more and again this is something maybe that came first from other industries uh, it's the idea of managing risk uh, in a proactive way and ensuring reliability. Um, and again, we've learned a lot from that, and there's lots and lots of different models of, of safety based on that, such as high reliability organizations or the, the framework from Charles Vincent, uh, which is freely available, measuring and monitoring safety. And again, if you think of our questions uh, in that context, it's, it's, you know, what's the risk here? Who might fall today? Uh, and what do we need to do to stop them falling? And then the last area that we've been focusing on in recent years, um, and I think it's 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 still very much in development, is, is how can we learn from success? We know that most of the time the care we deliver goes right and people aren't harmed. Um, and uh, that that means paying a lot of attention to to the normal work that we do and why why is it successful? Uh, and again, lots of different models there. And the most kind of, I suppose, familiar those now people may have heard this term of safety too. Um, and again, back to our questions there, you know, why did no one fall today, you know, even though we were so busy. Uh, so it, it's being a bit more curious and trying to figure out uh, why, uh, why we were successful. Um, and then uh, alongside that I identified uh, some of the key supporting factors uh, that are essential for leading for learning for designing and implementing uh, sustainable safety practices and uh, you know, to list those out here, uh, you know, their top of that list is is, is uh, human factors, and that really is is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, really, running alongside that are, are uh, the ideas of quality improvement and implementation science, um, co-production, doing things with uh, each other. You know, so so co-producing safety solutions with staff, but also involving patients from the beginning. Um, key then cultural features such as psychological safety and, and the whole area of safety culture. And I think that's something we'll come back to talk at maybe at our next meet. And then finally, safety and, and uh, uh, leadership and governance. You know, we, we need to, uh, to ensure these ideas uh, are, are uh, at the heart of, of, of how we lead and govern for safety. 
And just quickly to, to finish on this, you know, those three systems approaches there on the left, you know, uh, finding and fixing failure, learning from what went wrong, managing risk and reliability and promoting success. The supporting factors uh, are there alongside them. The interesting thing, though, is those supporting factors become more and more important, I believe, as you move down here. And, and as you get into promoting success, these supporting factors like human factors, like safety culture, become so important, almost to the point where, where they are the critical thing that you're doing in being safe. And there's an interesting relationship here with power um, and, and command and control in particular. And, and the further we move away kind of, um, uh, you know, to, to move towards promoting success, the less uh, role there is for command and control. And that, that's an important thing that we need to think of because uh, we need to, to, to trust people when we train them right and how to, how to deliver safety. And sometimes, uh, you know, power and command and control can get in the way. But that does mean that we need to spend a lot of time uh, knowing what we're doing and, and training people with the right with the right skills. So today we're going to focus on human factors, um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome two uh, great uh, uh, colleagues. And um, uh, I'd like first of all to introduce uh, Dr. Paul O'Connor, uh, who's research director for the Irish Centre for Applied Patient Safety and uh, Simulation uh, in Galway. And Paul is going to give us an introduction to uh, human factors in healthcare. And then um, I'd like to uh, uh, ask Kieran. Kieran Carthy is a, a former pilot and now works in the area of uh, training uh, human factors and uh, uh, safety in aviation. And I think uh, you'll find uh, that there's, there's lots of things that, that uh, both Paul and Kieran will, will uh, talk about that are absolutely applicable uh, in healthcare and improving safety. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you. So let me just share my screen. So you should be able to see that hopefully. So yeah, so I'm my brief was to talk about human factors in healthcare. So I've kind of changed the brief slightly in that uh, I think human factors in healthcare is often somewhat misunderstood. So I'm gonna address three kind of myths about human factors and how it's how it's what how it's thought about in healthcare. So hopefully that gives a kind of broader understanding of, of human factors, what it is and, and what it can do in terms of improving safety, efficiency, and productivity uh, in healthcare. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna go through each of these each of these three myths in this in this short talk. Um, so I think my experience of human factors, hearing people talking about human factors in healthcare is it's largely considered to be synonymous with teamwork and team training. So you hear people talk about kind of, you know, that was bad human factors or poor human factors. Um, and that's not really the whole story. And I think the reason that human factors has become synonymous with, with, um, with teams and, and team training, I think is probably because the model or the, how people thought about human factors comes from a, an aviation model or an aviation crew resource management model, which Kieran may, may speak about. And this is training that's largely focused on pilots, but it's now moved out to other to um, air traffic controllers and, and maintainers as well. But the focus is very much on the team and it's on, on human behavior. And so I think perhaps in the kind of 1990s, um, when pilots came and spoke at, at Grand Rounds, this is maybe where, where this, is, this has come from, because they mostly talk about behavior. CRM, I don't think makes sense within the context of healthcare because you don't exactly work in crews, you work in teams. And maybe human factors sound a bit more mysterious and exciting than teamwork training. So I think that this has been kind of this gravitation to, and what really it's often uh, healthcare practitioners are talking about when they're talking about human factors is they're actually talking about non technical skills. So non technical skills are the social, cognitive, and personal management skills that are necessary for safe and effective performance. So things like teamwork, leadership, situation awareness, decision making, uh, managing stress and, and fatigue. And uh, I wrote a book with Rona Finn and Margaret Christ in 2008 on these non technical skills. And we have stupidly agreed to revise this book. It sounded like a good idea last year when I agreed to it. And now that I am revising it, I kind of wish that we, we hadn't started. But uh, you know, things have changed since we wrote the book. But the but this, the, these are the, the non-technical skills, and these are important for team team performance. But it's not; it doesn't kind of encompass the whole of human factors. It's really just one part of human factors. So, what is human factors? So, it's the environmental, organizational, and job factors 
and the human and individual characteristics which influence behavior at work. So the non-technical skills covers the kind of the human aspects of this, but it's also a much broader consideration of where and how work is done. And uh, I've, I'll provide the link at the end. Myself and Angelo D wrote this introduction to human factors for healthcare workers. And there are some chapters on, on non-technical skills, but there's also lots of other stuff there as well. So it's this, this I don't think when the HC commissioned this, this is what they wanted. Uh, I think they wanted kind of 10 top tips to how to how to do good human factors, but there's no such thing exists. I don't think they wanted a hundred page kind of tome on everything there is on human factors, but uh, that's that's what we gave them. So this, this book kind of covers everything. And so you can see, if you think of uh, healthcare as a socio-technical model, um, human, the team training or, or non-technical skills training is in there around the individual and the team, but there's also other important factors that influence um, how healthcare is delivered. There's the patient themselves, and then there's the work environment that, that you're working in. Is there good lighting? Is it big enough? Um, can you do get good infection control practices there? There's the equipment that you're working with and how well that is designed for, um, for, for humans to work with. And sometimes it's not designed very well, as many of you know. It's how that equipment interfaces with other equipment. It's a big problem with alarms in healthcare. So you, um, you just add more equipment and all the alarms are at the same tone. It can be very difficult to distinguish what's what. So all of that impacts um, your performance. Then there's the individual, there's the, the training that that individual has received. There is um, what they are and are not able to do. There's the kind of, the, you know, fatigue. We can't all work for 24 hours straight effectively. So that, that's part of it too. There's the team, like I said, there's the, um, there's the, the leadership of the team. There's also the organization in, in which you work and how, how the, the, the hospital is managed. So presumably a better managed hospital will make delivery of care to the patient kind of easier than a less well-managed hospital. They even consider some of the cultural and regulatory influences way up there kind of at a, at a kind of HSC or even governmental level in terms of how many doctors and nurses we hire, what qualifications you need to be a doctor, a nurse, or an allied health professional. All of this influences the care that you give to the patients. So a kind of a, a proper overall understanding of human factors will consider all of this when um when when we're thinking about how care is delivered to patients and not just the non-technical skills of the of the individuals giving the care. And I think that's important because it stops the kind the kind of the blame culture. So you know if we say okay you know, if, you know a, a doctor or a nurse makes a bad decision so we need what do we need to do we need to fix the doctor or the nurse. Well maybe not maybe we need to fix the decision support tools that are supporting that doctor or nurse to make the decision. By considering this broader view of human factors, we're moving from focusing on fixing the individual and, and, and trying to make them make better decisions and really considering why the, 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 a, a poor decision might be made and, and recognizing that that isn't necessarily down to the individual. And if you look at this hierarchy of uh, patient safety interventions, so at the bottom we have people-focused interventions and at the top we have these systems-focused interventions. So people-focused interventions tend to be less effective. They're easier to implement to so things like non-technical skills training. Then you go up to kind of uh, checklists, and then we go up to standardization or protocols, like I've got the standardization of clinical handover. And then at the top, we have these kind of forced functions or automation. So this is where uh, you, you kind of really fix the problem. So for example, um, we have, a, we have a, on, our, on our master's in human factors and patient safety, we have a Vincristine um, error where Vincristine was delivered via the wrong route. So uh, intravenous Vincristine was delivered intrathecally. And we get our students to kind of analyze the, these, the, this, this mishap and work out kind of what, how we might prevent it and what went wrong. And what we found is lots of the students, they want more protocols, they want more training, they want punishments, they want all kinds of things in there. When actually the, the, the main ish thing that would have fixed this error would be if you can't connect the, the intravenous um, syringe to the interfecal connector, then we can almost we, you can almost deal with that problem. So you can see not lots of training on on this, but actually if we can actually fix further back in the system, then these kind of errors don't occur. So human factors is is all of this. It's the training, it's it's the checklist, the protocols, as well as seeing how we can design the system so that that error can can't be made. And like I said, those are the hardest ones to implement. 
We did a scoping view uh, recently on patient safety research carried out in, in Ireland. Uh, and I guess the good is you can see that in recent years, more we've been doing or we've been publishing more patient safety research. Uh, we've used Vincent's uh, measuring and monitoring um, safety framework, all of the focus was on past harm. You can see that there were six intervention studies that were reported, and actually of those, they were mostly further down that hierarchy of interventions to include my own study, which is included there in under education and training. So um, it's good there's more research occurring, but I think we need to try and get higher up those uh, that 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 um, that framework. So we're, we're looking at these force functions and, and really trying to ad address error or address issues as they occur and make sure that they can't be repeated. So my conclusion is um, definitely there's increased, there's much more non-technical skills training in healthcare than, than was the case five, 10 years ago. It's, it's much more widespread. It's happening in surgery, happening in anesthetics, happening in stress. It's happening in lots of different places now. So that's, that's, a very, that's very positive. Uh, and I'm certainly, I'm not saying that this is a, is a bad thing, but my concern now as we kind of move forward is if we're focusing too much on training and too much on the team, maybe this is propagating a kind of limited understanding of the potential of human factors to really impact healthcare. And my concern is that maybe for management or the people with the money is that we're kind of, um, we're suggesting that human factors is a kind of, it's a, it's a healthcare professional thing. It's not a system. It's not a systems issue. So I really think moving forward, we need to kind of move on from the team training, continue to do it, but also we need to recognize it's a systems issue and we need to start thinking about how we can we can address address this, this system and sort of not just focus on the um, on the person focused solutions to addressing uh, issues within a team. So myth two is that uh, human factors is equal to human errors, which which I think that comes from kind of the early 1990s. So when Jim Reason was moving into, he started to write some, some things on uh, some pieces like in, in the BMJ and places like that on kind of the Swiss cheese model on error. But there's been a much, from that time, there's been a much broader view of, of, human, of human factors. And in a lot of other industries where human factors have been around for a long time, they don't really talk about human error anymore. Because again, that's suggesting this is down to the human, this is down to the, to the person at the sharp end of the front line making an error, and it propagates this kind of idea that it's not a systems issue. So we need, again, we need to be kind of careful about that, I think, and move away from this focus on human error, fixing the human. So let's move from fixing the human to fixing, fixing the system. So we're not propagating this, this, this individual focus any longer. It also has human factors has implications beyond safety. So the safety implications are, are kind of obvious, but it also has implications for efficiency. It also has implications for, for quality as well. So we can move from safety to saying as much that it has a much broader application. And certainly sometimes safety is not a big sell to the people with the money, but when you start talking about efficiency and things like that, then they, they, they start to get interested. So I think we need to try and move it away from this is the safety focus, this is a human error focus. So this is actually taking using human factors principles, thinking about how the system is designed from a human perspective has much broader implications in safety in terms of how we use and run uh, the healthcare system. Uh, so I kind, of, I kind of said that, yeah. So improving vision, I, I do think it's going to be a stronger sell. Certainly when I was in the, uh, the American Navy, Okay, they're interested in safety, but they're much more interested in, in kind of performance and they're much more interested in efficiency than, than they are in safety. So I wonder if we can move the conversation. Now, perhaps we start to get buy-in from people who maybe wouldn't have bought into this before, who thought this was a training solution for frontline healthcare workers, rather than a systems focus that can look at safety, can look at quality, and it can look at, at efficiency. So my last myth is... Um, and I see this a lot in healthcare, you see this a lot in all kinds of other industries too, but it's taking something, taking an intervention or taking an approach that's been successful in one domain and trying to apply it in another domain and assuming you're going to get this kind of the same success. And we as human factors practitioners would spend a lot of time thinking about the specific context and studying and understanding the context in which an intervention is going to be introduced. And actually healthcare is, as you know, is incredibly heterogeneous compared to lots of other 
industries. And I would actually argue it's more of a collection of industries than one specific industry. So that's why it becomes even more important to really understand the context in which the work is taking place in healthcare before we impose an intervention that may not work. Maybe it's effective in one domain, but it may not work in another. So if you have a look at this kind of rather depressing uh, graphic, which looks at the, uh, the risk of fatal risk on the, uh, on the x-axis there, and they have lots of different industries. So you can see that nuclear industry, railway industry, civil aviation, civil aviation they're very safe. But at the other end, we have Himalayan mountaineering and professional fishing, which are much more unsafe. And then when you kind of overlay different aspects of healthcare, you can see that, they, that the kind of the risk crosses all of these different industries. And what that means in terms of intervention is that, as you guys know, blood transfusion, radiotherapy, standardized, controlled, protocol driven, that works for those kind of uh, applications uh, up to healthcare. So they, they can use approaches like are used in civil aviation or the nuclear industry, for example. But if we tried to do that in emergency ICU or in, in surgery, that may not work because that level of standardization and protocols is probably going to pre prevent people from being effective. And not only that, I guess in specific particular domains, maybe anesthetics being a case in point, the healthcare professional has to be able to move across these different industries, if you will, and apply different principles depending on what they're doing. So in, there's much more flexibility required in healthcare, and we, we can't and we need much more consideration about how people need to think. And I guess some of this is around healthcare professionals recognizing when they need to shift from thinking like a civil aviation pilot to thinking like a Himalayan mountaineer. And sometimes that, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that shift can be tricky. Maybe you do it implicitly, but it's recognizing that sometimes, you know what, standardization protocols and procedures, I need to think like that, that's applicable here. But you also know when to, have to know when to throw them out and, and, and relying more on your experience and on your gut feel. And I think for me, that's what makes uh, healthcare so interesting because you have to, you have to do this. And I, I don't know, I don't know if we have, you have these conversations but this, this shifting of thought means that how you think, how you work, how you make decisions, the interventions that we, the healthcare, we, the, uh, the research people or the, the management put on you may not work in all, in all conditions. So we have to understand this and we have to, and so that you guys, understand, uh, we're supporting you to do your job and we're not hindering you to do your job by over proceduralizing emergency ICU and saying you must follow the procedures, you must follow the protocols. When that's ridiculous, it doesn't work. It's not blood transfusion. It doesn't work in, in, in that circumstance. Here's an example. So when I was in the US Navy, one of the things that I did was look at this crew resource management, this non-technical skills training for that we delivered to to our pilots, or our aviators, I should say. And uh, I had, we looked, I looked at lots of different ways of looking at it. Anyway, this is one, one thing that we did was they have a safety climate questionnaire. And one of the, the questions is, is, is concerned with CRM or non-technical skills training. And you can see there in the early 2000s, the TAC Air, they are the, um, they're the fighter jet guys who fly off the back of um, an aircraft carrier, normally single seat, possibly dual seats. But you can see they were less positive about this new training that was being delivered than, than the other types of aviators. And the reason for this is they took um, civilian team training and they just imposed it across the Navy without, um, without really thinking what these guys needed within their context. So, okay, if you're a big wing kind of aviator flying in a team, then the civilian um, version of, of, of team training or non-technical skill training works reasonably well. It doesn't work that well if you're a single seat F-18 pilot flying off the back of an aircraft carrier. So they need to tailor it. They need to understand the domain that this training was, who, who they, the domain, the people they were delivering it to and tailor it. And once they did that, you can see kind of this that they realized this around 2000, 2003, it started to be better received and they started to get more buy-in to this training because it had been designed specifically for the needs of, of, of the pilots they were delivering it to. And it's not just even within one domain. I think you have to consider some of the, the local issues as well, because they, they differ. So for example, in this study where we looked at, the whole idea here was we were going to identify a, uh, an intervention to improve hand hygiene compliance in the ICU. Uh, so perhaps naively, I thought we would come up with one intervention, but we didn't because it's not the same as you guys probably already know. You know, 
the ICU in Sligo is not the same as the ICU in, in the matter. So if you're trying to impose some one size fits all uh, intervention to improve hand hygiene compliance, it's not going to work because the issues are not the same in, in, in both of those ICUs. So what we ended up doing was kind of identifying a suite of potential kind of hand hygiene interventions and a, a methodology for how you decide which ones are appropriate for your ICU. So it can be tailored to the needs of the ICU for where, you, where you're working. And it's not just, we just throw out this one thing and everybody has, has, has to do it. So it's not only considering the domain, you even need to consider the local kind of working conditions if you're going to have an intervention that works. And this is a pain in the arse, obviously, for researchers, for management, but it's, it's much better if we could, or much better, it's much more efficient and easier if we have one intervention that we can slam out to everyone. But um, I think I'll say in the next slide, but this one size fits all approach is in, is in danger of being a one size fits nobody. So you have an intervention, it's not really effective and you're wasting people's time, which obviously if people are busy is, is very annoying if you're going to training or you're having an intervention that people are spending all their time doing and it's not really addressing your problems. So we have to consider the work is done and work is done in one domain isn't the same as work is done in, in, in the other as opposed to this work is imagined. So we really have to, few in fact are practice practitioners, effective interventions, you really have to understand the context, the environments, everything where the work is being done if you want to design any kind of intervention, where, whether it be training, whether it be a force function intervention to, to ensure that it's, that, that it's effective and I think I don't know, maybe this isn't a story anybody wants to hear. It makes it harder, but it means that when your intervention is in place, it's going to work rather than, you know, top line thing. Isn't, isn't everything great here? Look, we've, we've put this intervention across all these places, but that's, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean anything if it's not having a, an impact. So if you want to have an impactful intervention that's going to make a difference, you really, it needs to be tailored um, to, 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 to where, where the intervention is being, is being implemented. So to kind of finish, we need to propagate, I think we need to propagate this correct definition of human factors in healthcare. Uh, Non-technical skills training is good, but uh, we can do more and, and human factors often is more. And we need to avoid this focus on just fixing the individual person-centered approach and really look at fixing the system and bringing in the management who are in charge of doing kind of the systems things, the IT things. All of those guys need to be brought in uh, in order to make a really big effective change. And we need to, need to uh, use human factors analysis approaches, techniques, to really understand work is done in a specific domain. And so we can develop interventions to address the issues in that specific domain. And uh, there's some links to some of the things I referenced in my talk. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, and I think we, we, you know, we, we'll get to maybe have some discussion around these issues in the panel, but I'm, I'm going to uh, hand over to Kieran now uh, just to talk about the experience of human factors in, in aviation. Thanks, John. Just give me one sec while I bring my, uh, yeah. my presentation up. Okay, how does that look? We're not seeing anything there yet. Yes. Bear with me. Any luck? Not yet. Yes. <laughs> well, we're trying to work. Yeah, we got you. Oh, here we go. Good stuff. I was going to ask Paul a question, but we'll leave it there afterwards. It's all that training here, and you can stay calm in these situations. Uh, I may look calm, but I'm. <laughs> 
I'm shaking here. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks, Paul. I, um, I'm happy to see in the chat box that Tomas has indicated that the um, presentations here will be recorded and they'll be available in the future because um, Paul covered a lot that's new and fresh for me. And I look forward to going back and uh, having a good listen to his, his presentation. So um, the airline industry started to incorporate human factors into our safety management systems back in the early to mid 1980s. And for me, that splits the graph that we're looking at on the screen neatly into uh, two components. Uh, on the left, first of all, if we look at the first two decades really of commercial aviation, the 1960s and 1970s, uh, that's the, uh, the first section on the left-hand side of the screen where you can see that our safety performance statistics showed a, a dramatic improvement. Uh, the other section of the graph covers the subsequent 40 years, bringing us right up to date, the, the latest figures coming from 2022. And whilst the uh, safety performance continued to improve, it's clearly at a, at a much shallower rate. So. The graph indicates it's, it's a measure that we use uh, on, on a yearly basis to assess our safety performance. And it's looking at the, the number of fatal accidents per million flights. And right at the beginning in 1960, there were 11 fatal accidents per million flights. And you can see right over on the right hand side, the most recent figures are showing that that rate has come down to 0.16. What uh, might surprise you is that that dramatic improvement in the first two decades of commercial aviation over on the left-hand side of the graph is purely down to technical improvements. So improvements in uh, aircraft design and the components we used in materials, uh, in automation, all producing the end result of incredible um, redundancy and reliability in, in our hardware. Uh, reliability that would have been unimagined back in the late 50s and 1960s. So that's, that, that, that rate of improvement, that dramatic rate of improvement is relatively easy to explain. So if we move to the right hand side and the shallower improvement uh, in the last 40 years or so, it's a little bit more difficult to, to explain because Whilst the technical innovations have continued, uh, particularly in, in uh, the incorporation of more sophisticated electronics in our, in our navigation and communication systems and electronic checklists, on top of that was the impact that the introduction of human factors would have had on our safety performance. And uh, for an industry that is very dependent on numbers and data, we, we can't put a figure on uh, what the contribution uh, and the impact that the introduction of human factors has had on our safety performance. Uh, and for me, who, who would like to claim that I'm a, a salesman for human factors, it would be nice to have a figure. It would be nice to say that 50% uh, of the improvement is down to human factors, but I, I can't. I don't have a figure. The industry doesn't have a figure. But from my 45 years in the industry, the best I can do is say that the contribution of human factors to our safety performance and the improvement of the safety performance has been significant. So getting back to the area on the left hand side, that two first decades, what might surprise you is that all those technical, all those technical safety innovations were resisted by pilots, every single one of them. Autopilots, auto control of our engines, the move from analog to digital instruments, and so on. And true to form then, as we introduced human factors in the uh, mid to, uh, the early to mid 1980s, once again, the pilot group who were going to be uh, the group that most benefited from the introduction of human factors, along with our passengers, obviously, uh, 
stonewalled any attempt to introduce human factors. So I think the, the lesson to take from these two slides is that the attempt to embed human factors, principles and training and techniques into any system or any organization is not going to be overnight. After, after John's introduction in series one, which anybody who hasn't seen, I'd, I'd strongly recommend uh, you go back and look at the recording of John's presentation in, uh, in series one, uh, where he covered the science of uh, patient safety. And it was, a, it was, John, it was a super whistle stop tour. Uh, you know, you covered from, from Socrates all the way up to simulators and, and a lot in between. And for me, I found it, uh, again, very refreshing and a great recap uh, and a background to what, what we're about here. And uh, you, you put the Irish uh, healthcare service in context and where human factors is uh, in that context. So uh, I think prompted by that, I, I went and had a look at what the World Health Organization have to say about human factors. And, they, uh, in 2016, published an article called the Technical Series on uh, safer, safer Primary Care. And they were making the point that uh, unsafe care has become a concern. And the, the work that has been done looking at the, the causes, the consequences and solutions to unsafe care has mostly been focused on hospital settings. And they go on to make the point that every day around the world, millions and millions of people access primary care. And in fact, for the majority of people, primary care is their first introduction to, to healthcare. And going on from, from that, the World Health Organization are saying that uh, safe primary care will lead to uh, less uh, unnecessary hospitalizations. And the, the reverse is also true, that unsafe primary care will lead to an increase in, in avoidable hospitalization. So I think the key message to take from, from that publication and, and the World Health Organization's point is that uh, human factors, any human factors program must address the entire system and, and not focus on, on a specific area. Uh, one of, one of uh, Paul's uh, modules in his, his presentation, I found very interesting because the, the language we use around human factors uh, is critical. Uh, it's critical from a uh, a sales point of view, it's, 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 it's critical from uh, trying to get the message across. And I think we made a very unfortunate mistake by using the term at an early stage, and it seemed to gain traction, and it's still there. We talk about the soft skills. Uh, Paul was referring to, to the non-technical skills. Would we often use the phrase soft skills to talk about the non-clinical, the non-technical skills? And I think it's an unfortunate use of, of terminology because uh, again, last night I was doing a little bit of research and I just had a look at what, what, what are synonyms for the word soft? And the list was mushy, squashy, slushy, sloppy, squidgy, squishy. Uh, and it all gives a sense that the soft skills or the non-technical skills are inferior to, to the, um, the technical, clinical skills. And I think th th this is far from correct. Um, so uh, excuse me if I'm going to be a little bit dramatic, but I'm going to be talking about an area that I'm, I'm not familiar with. But uh, less than three weeks ago, um, in the uh, emergency department over in, in UHG in Galway, the, the team in the emergency department were, were coming off shift after seven, seven nights on the road. Um, I'm trying to imagine. Uh, the, the state of mind and uh, the performance of, of that team. At, at 5.45 in the morning, on Monday morning, uh, the bleeps and the telephones started to ring in the unit. Uh, just at a point 
in, in their circadian rhythm where they were clearly thinking about their days off, uh, recovery from seven, seven nights of intense duty. Uh, and as you do at that stage of the morning, you're thinking about how you're going to recover your sleep during the, the following week off, uh, catching up on uh, domestic uh, family, friends, hobbies, uh, NCTs that are due, uh, bills that have to be paid. Uh, and, and now suddenly things start to happen. The bleeps are going, the phones are going. And word comes in that there's been uh, a serious road traffic accident out around Hedford. And I don't know if you'll all remember, uh, it's not that long ago. Four youngsters uh, aged 14 and, and 13 um, critically injured in the accident and they were on their way to UHG. And I, as an outsider, I'm trying to imagine how that team had to pick themselves up and deal with the incoming, uh, the incoming trauma. And lo looking down the road as the situation developed, sure, the technical clinical skills uh, had to be, uh, uh, had to be uh, applied. So lines had to be put in, uh, CPR had to be applied, uh, blood flows had to be stemmed. But if you think about the bigger team, uh, anaesthetists were involved, surgeons were involved, every department, the mortuary was involved, the uh, paramedics coming in doing the handover were involved. You're talking a big, big team here. And don't, don't kid me that uh, the, the soft skills, those squishy, squashy uh, human factor skills uh, on that morning were, were equally important. So really uh, soft skills, uh, I, I wish we never had adopted that, uh, that term. I just want to talk about three observations that I've made in the 15 years that I've engaged with, engaged with you, John, and, and the healthcare uh, system. Uh, observations that I, I have made into statements and then in turn made into, made into questions that I'm just going to throw out there. So it's an observation. I may be wrong. But I make the statement and I turn it into a question and I'm just asking, why does HF training in healthcare appear to come at the, at the postgraduate stage? And if you think about a career in, in, uh, in medicine, in healthcare, whether, it, whether it's nursing or as a doctor or uh, any practitioner, at the postgraduate stage, it's probably the, the, the busiest, most intimidating stage. You've just come out of your training you're into the live environment, uh, you're uh, uncertain, uh, you're, you're extremely challenged. And to be introducing human factors at that stage, to me, just doesn't make sense. So why, why is human factors training optional? Why do you have the choice to buy in? And finally, Paul talked extensively about, about teamwork. Uh, and indeed, I think multidisciplinary teamwork is becoming more and more a feature uh, in, in your profession. So it's an impression that I've got that some specialties are a little bit further ahead than others on the HF road. And I think that's a little bit unfortunate because the more multidisciplinary interaction that you've got, if it's the case that uh, there are different understandings and different appreciations and different attitudes to human factors, surely that weakens the whole, uh, the whole basis, the whole foundation of, of what human factors is about, which is, which is teamwork and uh, coordination, cooperation and, uh, and leadership. So all the more reason to be introducing human factors principles and concepts at day one of med school. So I'll just put up the last slide there. I know there's a, a chat box here. Uh, and uh, if this was a live environment, I'd love to see your reaction as you scratch your heads and wonder why is he finishing uh, with this particular slide? So if, if you want to put your suggestions or your guesses in the chat box, feel free. But uh, on a positive note, I want to, I want to just wrap up by, by saying that, that there are some really, really encouraging signs and indicators that I've seen 
that uh, you're embracing human factors. Uh, credit, as always, John, to yourself for, for your, your tireless work uh, in quality improvement and, and safety, uh, patient safety and human factors and, and the work uh, you and I do together in our CPI. To IEHG uh, for this initiative, uh, which I, I find fascinating and, uh, and really encouraging to see. Uh, to Paul and, and Angelo O'D for their excellent publication. Paul has mentioned it a couple of times in intro to uh, Human Factors for Healthcare Workers. Uh, and to, to RCSI and UHG in particular for uh, the pace at which they're rolling out simulation uh, as, a, as a really invaluable tool, not just for the technical skills, but from our point of view, from, from the point of view of what we're discussing today, uh, as, as a super non-jeopardy training platform for the, for the non-technical skills. Uh, to Tomas for uh, taking the initiative and inviting uh, UCD med students. I hope there are a lot of you out there listening. And, uh, and of course, our, our, your, and, your and our colleagues uh, in nursing. Um, so, uh, I just realized I haven't mentioned the core competencies that we talk about in, in human factors training. And, and they're essentially leadership, teamwork, good, safe decision making, situational awareness, uh, resilience, and there are a number of others, but they're the key ones. So back, back to this slide, uh, let me explain this. So uh, there are four A4 sheets of paper there, blank, uh, six um, paper clips, six rubber bands, and six straws. And just prior to COVID, I, I was inv very involved in uh, pilot recruitment and uh, assessment for applicants uh, for pilot, uh, pilot positions in a couple of airlines. And this is what I brought with me to the assessment day. So I want you to imagine yourselves, uh, you know, any of you, any of you who are considering a change of career and maybe becoming airline pilots, or if you know somebody who's aspiring in that direction, uh, you, you will be faced with, uh, with these materials on your assessment day. So imagine you're here for assessment with a group of, uh, let's say 30 other wannabes. And uh, the, the brief is that the group of 30 is divided up into uh, uh, groups, of, uh, groups of six. So five groups of six, uh, there's a stopwatch, a big stopwatch on the wall, and um, there are tables with this equipment on the table. You're told that, that each team uh, is involved in a competition. The competition is to build the tallest structure possible given that equipment. Uh, so think about that. You've got your name badge on and you go over to the table with, with four other strangers. And uh, the brief is in 15 minutes, build the tallest construction as possible. At the same time, think about those human factor skills, those soft skills, uh, those non-technical skills, leadership, teamwork, decision-making, situational awareness, communications, and resilience. And we start looking at those as soon as the stopwatch starts. Thanks, John. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Karen. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Tomas and uh, and Tim there just uh, to to get some discussion going. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Karen and Paul for uh, fascinating talks. And uh, I'm going to go back and look at the recording again. Uh, particularly, a lot of new concepts from Paul, which I can identify with. I think hitting the nail on the head there a lot. We have Prof. Eva Darty, who's Director of Human Factors and Patient Safety in RCSI. Uh, Eva, you might have some comments. There's a lot to digest. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. So my name's Eva Darty. I'm a, a practicing clinical psychologist and I'm Director of the Human Factors and Patient Safety at RCSI. And that encompasses three main programs. We have, uh, we have, if you like, our professional training, which in answer to you, uh, Kieran, is mandatory for our surgeons and emergency medicine um, uh, ophthalmology trainees. So they have to come. They don't complete their training if they don't attend. They get approximately 20 courses over the entire 
um, of, of their training and we assess their communication skills in years one and two. And those marks are very, they're very high stakes um, assessments. And, um, and we cover all those competencies that you were talking about there. So I was kind of ticking them off in my head when you were listing them out and I was saying that that's okay, that's okay. Um, but, um, and in answer to your question, because this is one that is debated actually all over the world, I'm, I'm very involved in the International Association for Communication in Healthcare. And one of the things that's recognized is that when you do this kind of training at the undergrad level, if, if the if the I'll just talk about doctors. Um, if the if the new newly graduating doctors go out into the big bad world and don't see those principles, um, you know, being practiced around them, um, unfortunately the skills degrade. And um, so I think if if it's going to be only done at undergrad, we have to have the confidence that they're seeing it out there in the workplace, which unfortunately at the moment is not the case. So if you like, it's it's kind of like a balance there that you have to take. You know, do we do we focus on the undergrads, you know, with the with the fear that they're going to lose those skills when when they graduate, which is what seems to happen? Or do we start with the postgrads and then when we're confident that those principles are being practiced out in the workplace, then we can go to the undergrads. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, I suppose the reason why some specialties are more further ahead than others, that's really down to individuals. I mean, I didn't start the human factors program. That was the um, the love child, if you like, in inverted commas of Oscar Trainer, a hepatobiliary surgeon who had took that initiative. And um, he did get kind of business trainers to do it at the start. In, um, and then it sort of lacked fidelity for the trainees. So um, that's where I came in. So, um, and other colleagues. So, I mean, I'm at the coal face trying to make this stuff interesting and practical and applicable for learners. And that's certainly been an interesting learning curve. But we get good feedback now from, from the trainees because they see that it does make a difference. Uh, it does make things more efficient. Um, it does make um, things easier for them. And that's really what it's all about. And I totally take what Paul is saying. I mean, human factors is more than just training people. It, you know, it's it's much bigger than that. Thank you, Eva. I, I agree with that uh, conundrum, chicken and egg. When you're introducing a new concept, you have to teach the undergrads. But if the postgrads don't know about it, then so I suppose the answer is you have to teach both. And that's that's a big challenge because that involves undergraduate curriculum change and um postgraduate, uh, you know, getting into every specialty's postgraduate training. It's a big challenge, but I think that's part of the focus of today is to get people's minds focused on it. Just to plug, the Ireland East Hospital Group does have some places left on a um, Foundation Human Factors Day on the 4th of May, uh, particularly for deteriorating patients, sepsis, people working in that area. And Louise Grimes is the contact uh, for that in Ireland East Hospital Group. So that, that'll be an excellent day next Thursday. And there's an excellent... Um, HSE land uh, human factors introduction to that. So thank you for that, Eva. I know Ger O'Connor is uh, work, works there in the RCSI teaching emergency medicine um, training simulation, which obviously uh, incorporates human factors. I don't know if Ger has any comments. Uh, yeah, Thomas, thanks. I thought that was a very interesting set of presentations. Um, just a comment, I think one of the reasons that we look to aviation uh, as an industry to emulate is obviously their kind of safety culture and their record. And, you know, I think what we found there was some great insights into the challenges of translating this kind of success um, back into back into healthcare um, and maybe kind of some pointers into the into some solutions to do that. Um, agree with the comments about human factors. I'm obviously heavily involved in simulation, both um, with Eva in RCSI. Uh, I'm actually in here today, Eva, and um, also involved in a lot of in situ simulation in the matter. And obviously heavily involved with Paul as well through the Irish Association for Simulation. Um, I think for those of us uh, who work at that kind of emergency interface, and Karen, you described that very, very accurately for someone who's not, uh, you know, who's not a frontline clinician, and 
that scene in the scene in Galway. So for those of us who work at that emergency interface, um, obviously I find it disturbing. Um, that slide from Paul at the risk in terms of patient safety is at the level of a Himalayan climber. Um, you know, that was pretty, pretty stark. Um, but then you, you do see solutions within that and that, you know, if you break down some of the individual tasks like, uh, you know, some of that kind of elective anesthesia, blood transfusion, you know, has moved to the safe side of that uh, continuum. So it is possible to uh, take bite-sized chunks off some of those kind of individual processes and move those processes to the safe side of that uh, that continuum. Uh, so yeah, excellent set of talks. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. And I see um, Eva's highlighted human factors in patient safety conference in September 29th, which will which will be fascinating. I mean, this is something we we weren't taught in medical school, but this is something that affects our everyday life, our job every every day, um, and the challenge of educating the older generation like myself and, and the undergraduates uh, in all specialties is significant. And I'd just like to bring in Joe Duggan, a uh, director of education in, in uh, the Pillar Center here in the matter, who has basically set up an m, &M meeting, which has been fantastic for the medics. Um, and obviously human factors plays into that, that Joe, if you want to comment. Yeah, um, thanks, Tomas, um, and thanks for the invitation. And uh, really, two really superb, thought-provoking talks from Paul and Kieran on, on, on human factors. So, as Tomas says, with the support of the Pillar uh, Centre at the Matter, I've managed to establish a monthly um, morbidity and mortality meeting for for medicine and all its subspecialties. And we're achieving audiences of of sixty to seventy people per month, uh, interns, SHOs, registrars, and consultants. It's quite difficult to stop the consultants speaking, so I try to encourage the uh, the trainees to speak rather than the consultants. Um, but uh, to date, um, we've had eight meetings, and recurring themes are, uh, you know, really uh, system factors, human factors, with communication and handover being being major issues. And by linking in with the, um, the, the QI department of the matter, we're actually trying to make changes and show the show the consultants and the trainees that we're actually doing something about the issues that are raised. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know, uh, certainly the RCSI are involved in this space and, and this is mandatory training for surgical trainees and emergency medicine trainees. I don't know if the RCPI, I don't know if anybody is aware of human factors training, postgraduate training. I know obviously John is involved with the diploma. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we would have a lot of human factors in our in our postgraduate certificates. And, and I think uh, like the discussions have, human factors is very broad, I think, you know, and and and, and maybe, you know, various areas are focused on, on an aspect of it, you know, such, you know, around kind of team or situation awareness or, or you know, and then you've got the whole system application of it, as Paul was was kind of uh, highlighting. So, uh, you know, I think I, th I think over time, hopefully, we'll see it, it, it kind of move into that broader sense, you know, of, of being used. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, part of the part of the difficulty here sometimes is the language. And like Paul has highlighted, you know, is is it is it just teamwork or is it the system? Well, it's both, you know, and and it's trying to bring those two together really to, to make uh, care safe and, and that just takes time and it takes it's like building something I think you've got to get the foundations in and then you know through creating awareness like we're doing today I think you uh, you know you, you generate greater interest in it and and internationally uh, you know human factors is being recognized like Kieran suggested in in with the WHO you know it's, it's been recognized as a key you know supporting factor for patient safety. Yes, I, I don't know if we can, um, how we can influence uh, medical schools and their undergraduate curricula. It would be nice to get something centrally, perhaps, I don't know whose role, the, if that's the Irish Medical Council's role, um, but that certainly would be worth looking at. And then uh, approaching the colleges formally, because I suppose there are other colleges other than RCPI and RCSI. Yeah, um, and, and interdisciplinary. I mean, I think that's the key thing here. You know, it, it's not, you, you can't just teach one discipline. I mean, we've all got to have a common understanding of human factors, you know, and at its most basic level, you know, how it impacts on teamwork, uh, you know, across everybody, but how it impacts on the systems, you know, that we all work in. 
Yeah, I suppose it's maybe something at uh, NDTP level we could discuss as well. Yeah. Um, but certainly the overlap between pay, um, quality, safety and efficiency, Paul, I, I, I liked as well in your slide, because, I mean, there's certainly ways we can change our practice to make things better for everybody. Um, and it's that challenge of change of practice, which was highlighted so well in Kieran's slide there, um, which is something we face, I think, on a daily basis. Um, I think one comment, I, I suppose that, uh, thank you, they're great talks uh, and <clears throat> it strikes me there's time to think and chew over them and reflect upon them. Um, I suppose I often think there's ongoing tension between our present system, which is often driven by clinical service, perhaps without due regard for terms and conditions of staff, and hence we can't recruit and retain good staff, which is kind of stupid, but that's what happens. And then on top of that, there's often individual blame, whether it's medical legal blame, whether it's criminal charges which happen, whether it's coroner's court, whether the medical council are complaining about us, it's a further tension again on the system. And then we get a change of policy on a regular basis with our latest iteration, slaughter care. But how are we going to implement slaughter care? That's a real challenge, which needs deep thought, reflective reflection, a time, effort, iterative process, communications, you know, engagement, and ask the staff for help, which we're never asked for, which is remarkable, isn't it? I always think, you know, if I was a minister of health. I'd be asked to the nurses, doctors, I like your profession. Can you help me and line up to do this? But it's never asked. So one of the processes that we've been trying to do as chief academic officers is trying to influence the system to think about an academic health science system. And that's a learning culture. And it struck me from Paul and, and Kieran and Eva and Jer's comments that that would perhaps be very helpful, but it's going to take time and that you've got a system with ongoing learning across medicine, nurses, other care professions, admin and management, that you build this system into it. And Eva's comment that fidelity is really important. Often we're given things that just don't apply because it's a recipe approach or protocol. As uh, Paul said, it doesn't work and needs a flexible fleet of foot, shiftable system to do that. Uh, for the super talks, I should say that we are, have a conference coming up in May 18th which are trying to inform and perhaps influence the decision makers about academic health science systems. And we have speakers from Johns Hopkins, Newcastle, and University of Vancouver. We've done it differently. Can we apply that here and hence implement slaughter care using that model, which might give us a chance to build some of that into it. Lastly, I thought the picture of straws and the paper and the rubber bands and the paper clips here was excellent. My thought was the straw was to suck up that soft skills that are squishy, mushy, and gooey was the purpose of the straws. Thank you. I, I don't know if you have a comment on the straw. There, there is, there is one question slightly off topic. We should have an enhanced induction for doctors arriving from other countries. That is in the new task force report, uh, which is not specifically the topic, but there's a, if anybody hasn't seen the new NCHD task force report, just look it up. It's it's available online. Um, Kieran, I don't know if you want to come back in with the, the paper and straws and uh, paper clips. <laughs> Uh, as a, as an assessor, uh, for me, it was fascinating because the, the selection process that I went through is so radically different to um, what happens now. And I think the parallel for me, and I may be completely wrong here, is the introduction of the HPAT uh, for you guys. So I think you, you recognize some years ago that you were getting some of the most brilliant academics uh, into medicine. Uh, and down the road, it was quite obvious that they didn't have the people skills that are, uh, that are essential. We had, we had a similar challenge. We were um, certainly when I joined in 1978, uh, my leave insert was the primary uh, criteria that my suitability was, was assessed on. But walking around a table watching uh, six youngsters trying to assemble um, a construction, you can see pretty much all of those um, non-technical skills come out. Uh, and we're watching clearly for the outliers who just don't get involved. Uh, we look for, for leaders, we look for good decision makers. And uh, when, when the clock is ticking, it's, uh, it's a fascinating exercise. It's to watch uh, to watch the human behavior. So maybe at the next uh, time we have we have very we have very few face to face interviews these days. It's most easy. But the next time we have face to face interviews, maybe we'll I'll give all the candidates the paper and just draw <laughs> see what, see what they come up with. So listen, thanks a million. It's been a fascinating morning. We've gone over time. 
and we look really look forward to the third in the series at the on the last Friday in May. Uh, we'll um, we'll circulate that the third in the patient safety series from John. So really, thanks to John for putting all this together. Th thanks to Kieran and Paul for the excellent talks, and Eva and Jura and Joe for uh, the their um, contributions and uh, hopefully we'll, we've all got a better, un better understanding of what human factors and patient safety is. I certainly have. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for that. I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.